good afternoon where I am. I hope you're having a good day. It's time for us to start our fall semester Bible study. I know, let's see, I think we might have made it down to 89 degrees today. So yeah, fall is in the air. Is that is that what it's going to be? <laughs> Not very cool yet, but I can already see leaves falling off the trees. So it's a good sign that fall is coming. And our Bible study series from now through November, we usually take December off just because everybody's so busy, it's hard to get together. But uh, following up on the series that we did in the spring of pulling our profile together with our spiritual gifts and our, our temperaments and our uniqueness and how we fit into a family, what our birth order is, all of those things. But we're going to take it a step further this time and use Bible personalities to see who we're most alike. I think you'll find it interesting. And so the title of this series is Fearfully and Wonderfully Made and the Difference Grace Makes. Um, my, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, I have a lot, but one of them is 1 Corinthians 15, 10, where Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly, he said, than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. That's saying a lot coming from Paul, but don't you just love that he accepted the person that God had made him. He had used it for not so good purposes, nefarious purposes, and he, he turned that around, grace turned that around uh, for him. But the objectives in this series, objectives are to understand how uniquely we're made, to gain a better understanding of ourselves and others, and to grow in grace and enhance our personal growth in ministry. And so that's the goal. We're going to be working toward that. But think about this, becoming a Christian doesn't eliminate human personality. We have personalities. We're going to have personalities in heaven. God has personalities. Um, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us and we know he comforts and he convicts and we can quench the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. So obviously God has feelings too. And if we didn't have personality, how would we recognize each other in heaven? Hmm. Of course, the question does come up occasionally. The people who irritated us on earth, well, we find them irritating when we're in heaven too. Well, we're all going to be in our glorified bodies and be perfected. So I think we'll all get along. Um, but being a Christian should just add grace to the personality that God has already given to us and that we've developed. And I think we see that really well in Paul. Uh, we are actually individually bent a certain way. If you think about the people in your family, they are so different. Even if they grow up in the same house, the siblings are all different. I know that's true in our case. There were five of us growing up. We're all completely different, except we did always say that the baby, the fifth one, kind of got a little bit of all of our personalities, but we're all different. Even if we are so much under the same circumstances, a lot of times. So God just intends for us to have our own individual, unique personality. The Bible says this, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And then he goes on and says to do all things without murmurings and disputings that we may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Why aren't we there? Among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. That's from Philippians, so that's Paul talking and giving those verses, of course, as he was given those verses, those things to say by the Holy Spirit. Not two quotes that I thought would be beneficial for us. I, I think about them often. One is the conversion of a soul is the miracle of a moment. The manufacture of a saint is the task of a lifetime. So true. We are always sowing our future. We are always reaping our past. Okay, so now that that has grounded us, those thoughts, I will move on with our lesson. Lesson. I was reminded talking about the, you know, the nation that we live in and the perverseness right now. I saw a commercial come on TV the other day. I don't remember. It was some type of prescription drug, which they give you those for everything these days, don't they? But what caught my attention, it said this, pre this medication is for those who were assigned female at birth. They're assigning people to be female at birth? Actually, this is the thing. I told my class this the other day in school. I said, 100 years from now, if somebody were to dig up your body, there are only two choices of gender that they're going to decide. You're either male or female. 
Uh, but that's not popular conversation these days for sure. But the purpose of this Bible study is looking at the personalities of people in the Bible, characters in the Bible. We learn a lot from studying them. We can relate our story to their story a lot of times. And the Bible gives us a lot of people to choose from. So thinking about the fact that we're women, women and adding that into the mix of that, we operate a lot on feelings, don't we? We certainly do. Uh, which our feelings are about as certain as the sand on the sea. Have you ever stood at the shoreline of the ocean and you're standing in one place in the sand at one moment and then it just keeps shifting around you and you feel as if you're moving? So feelings change like that. The good news is that God gave us feelings. He has feelings. Um, and so he understands where we're coming from and he made us a lot like we are to accomplish what it is that he has for us to accomplish. Two things um, easily change us on any given day, people and circumstances. I remind myself that without people, most of us wouldn't have a job, would we? So that kind of keeps us grounded a little too. We are so easily influenced and changed by words and actions and tones. Sometimes all it takes is just a look on somebody's face. And I have often thought you have to separate the message and the messenger sometimes to be able to receive it because you can just tell by the look on some people's faces what they think and they cause you to think whatever you probably shouldn't have thought. But, and we respond so easily. We can cock an eyebrow, roll our eyes, cross our arms, huff and puff, a lot of decisions. It's been said that women have so much power in the smallest gesture. Um, I told my class one time, of a class of ladies, um, not the teenagers, I said, if you just wonder how much power you have in the smallest gesture, go out and wink at the wrong man when you walk in the auditorium for the service. Yes, you'll find out just a wink, just the slightest twitch of your mouth or whatever. A lot of power in that. But so easily we are angered at times, and that's one of the feelings that, that we definitely need, controlled by the Spirit. I heard Charles Stanley say one time uh, that when you're angry about something or irritated about something, picture yourself at a red light and you're stopped. The light is red and you are stopped and think. There are three ways you can go, left, right, or straight. And he said, before you make a move, decide where you're going to make your anger go and then go from there. He said, you'll make a wiser decision if you do that. Just tell your anger where to go. Good thought, good analogy. Um, I grew up in a preacher's family, 25 years in a preacher's family before I married and 40 years as a preacher's wife. And this is what I have come to realize. We are so much more tolerant of others if we understand where they're coming from why they say what they say and why they do what they do. There are reasons behind that. Uh, one of the books that I have said, a wise woman knows the key to a good marriage is in knowing the difference between what makes your husband tick and what makes your husband ticked. Yeah, we all know that, don't we? So in this study, I think you'll better understand yourself and your spouse and your children and your friends and your in-laws, and your co-workers, and your church members, all of the things. I think it will be beneficial because we're all just bent a certain way. We have bent a certain way personalities. But we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul, but before he was the Apostle Paul, he was the Agnostic Paul, and, and then he met Grace. He still had the same strong personality after conversion that he had before conversion. And I'm going to convince you of that in this lesson. I have a quote here from Warren Wiersbe, and he has a book that's titled Bible Personalities, A Treasury of Insights for Personal Growth and Ministry. I encourage you to get it. If you can, it's hard to find a copy these days, but this is what he said about Paul. The Apostle Paul had one of those arresting magnetic personalities that inevitably produces a polarizing effect upon those around them. When confronted with his dynamic, disciplined, decisive character, they were compelled to act. He's still compelling people 2,000 years later to act. We have all responded to things that Paul has said in his 13 books that he wrote. How amazing is that? He was killing Christians and God used him to write 13 books of the New Testament. It's where we get a lot of our Christian living from. So I'm going to give you uh, just um, some things about Paul's personality. I think you might find yourself there or you might find somebody you know well there and then it might make you help you understand them a little bit better. Keep in mind that unsaved Paul was judgmental and inflexible. Remember, judgmental. He held women and children even to jail. He was dogmatic and controlling. He was a crusader for the law. 
saved Paul was ethical and reliable and product productive and wise and fair and honest and orderly and self-disciplined. And he was still a crusader. He was just a crusader for Christ, for grace. So crusader for the law, unsaved, crusader for grace as a saved man. So just some facts about his personality. Motivated by a longing for a just and moral world. He was still that way. He believed that what he was doing before he was saved was the right thing to do. And so he did it with gusto, with everything that he had. But in 1 Corinthians, we're going to use his words here to figure him out. 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Listen to this part. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. Then he said, I speak this to your shame. Have you ever said shame on them? Shame on you? Yeah, he, he just called them right out. Uh, number two, he took education seriously. Remember, he, he said how well he was educated, set at the feet of Gamaliel. Uh, he, said, he says of himself that he was zealous toward God um, once he was saved, zealous toward God. Uh, first, it was the perfect law of the fathers. Then it was the perfect law of the father, which was grace. But uh, people with this personality of Paul's, they take education seriously. They're avid readers. They love books. They love words. They're deep thinkers. Do you remember when Paul was in prison close to the end of his life? Uh, he said, um, please, please bring me my cloak and the parchments. He still wanted to read. He knew his time was getting close to end. He still wanted to read and wanted to study. This is a verse that I think is humorous. Uh, in Acts 26, 9, Paul says, I barely thought with myself that I ought to do many things. He thought to himself, I ought to do many things. Yeah, interesting insight to Paul there. Um, th number three, driven to go forward and accomplish the task given. He said, this one thing I do, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And he also said, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Just always very task-driven, Paul was. Perhaps that's you. Perhaps you're very task-driven, too. So you understand where he's coming from, that it was just a constant push for what he felt needed to be accomplished. I have, there were five of us, as I was mentioning a minute ago, growing up. My baby sister, Christiana, who's in heaven now, was very much task-driven, and she taught in school for us for, for many years until the Lord called her home. But she would get a job done. It did not matter what she had to do to accomplish it. She would get it done. And my husband used to say, I can give this to Christiana to get done and she will get it done. But I'm going to have to hand out body bags when she's finished. Because she would just go at it. You know, come hell or high water, they say. That's what she did. Just to go after it to get things done. Number four Careful of behavior so their conscience doesn't condemn them. This is a, a personality trait of this Bible character that we're studying. It says in Acts 23, 1, And Paul earnestly, beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Before God and before them, he had lived in all good conscience. Basically what he's saying is he can just wipe his hands. He, there's nothing else that Paul could do. He's lived in all good conscience. And I just had a mental contrast to think about Pilate, who also washed his hands, but how what a stark difference there is between Pilate washing his hands and Paul washing his hands. So it's all in what was accomplished and what was meant by that. Number five, with this personality, conscious of duty and responsibility, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Paul said, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong, yep, be men. Um, I was down at Brother Tom Sexton's church a few years back, and I, a lady in, that was at the conference said, ask her husband to carry her bag or purse to the car for her or something. He said, I can't do that. She said, I really need you to help me. He said, I can't do that. He said, the pastor will take away my man card. And as it turned out, they had actually handed out man cards to the men in the church. And Brother Sexton said, if I find any of you not being manly, I'm going to take your card back from you. Uh, but yeah, be men. Yeah, Paul just says right out. Yeah, uh, watch ye, stand fast, quit you like men, be strong, stand fast in the faith. Um, number six, this personality, compulsively punctual. Several times he said, when I come, 
And then he said, let all things be done decently and in order. He was very, very regimented about what had to be done and when, and he stuck with that. I'll give us women a disclaimer here. If we are ever running late, it's because we try to do one more thing because we have so much to do. It's not that we've been lounging around, you know? There are things that we have to do. So we're gonna give ourselves an out right there. I remember when um, I had had Meredith, um, and I was going to nurse her between Sunday school and church. Well, my husband was on the platform. I wasn't going to make it in before the service started. And when I walked in the back, I was just going to sit down in the back until handshaking time or whatever, greeting time, and, and move up to the front. But when I walked in, my husband from the platform did like this. Looked at his watch, held it up to make sure it was still working. After church, I said, if you ever do that again, you can count on it. If I am not in there when the service starts, there's a very good reason I am not there. Um, but this personality is very punctual. Number seven, another uh, factor, inclined to deny and discipline themselves. Remember, Paul was the one who said, wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh. And do you remember how long? While the world standeth. For the rest of his life, he would not eat any meat if it offended his brother. That's very disciplined, very much denying yourself for sure. Uh, he also said, I die, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ, like just disciplined, Paul was. Eight, prone to find fault and call people out. We have to control that by the Holy Spirit, don't we? Are you ever tempted to call somebody out? Um Paul was the one who said, oh, foolish Galatians. Have you ever wanted to tell anybody something like that? Who hath bewitched you, he said. Who tricked you that you should not obey the truth? He goes on and talks about young widows. Uh, he says, and with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. Paul, who was not married, I mean, it's been speculated, what could he have been a widow? I don't think he was ever married myself. I think he was just a single man. Um, and if he had been married, wow, that would have been a lot of personality, wouldn't it? And he's always traveling, first of all, killing people, and then preaching. Um, anyway, that's for another day. But I can just imagine that when he, you know, on his boat pulling up to the shoreline, all of those women that he had had things to say to, just calling them out on what they should wear and say and where they should go and all of that, can't you just see them with their um, parchments rolled up, mm -hmm, shaking them at him as his boat approaches the shore? I can just picture that in my mind. He called Peter out. Do you remember that in Galatians 2? It says, but when, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. That's what Paul said of Peter, one of the favored three disciples. So people with this personality might call you out on something. Number nine, known for circling back to check on things. Acts 15, 36, and some, days after Paul, and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every, every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Do you think that should be see what they're doing? <laughs> yeah, he was just going back to check on them, which we know he loved them. Uh, but he was going back to check to make sure the things that he had instructed them in and told them about they were doing those things. There's a saying, um, people don't do what you expect, they do what you inspect. Yeah, just circling back to make sure it gets done. And then the last trait uh, that we'll mention about Paul has boundless energy, a trait which tends to overwhelm others. Think of all the things that Paul did, and he just kept going and kept doing. Um, just it pro His boundless energy probably did, probably did overwhelm others. He says this, that God's grace, which was bestowed upon, he said, bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than them all. He also said, this we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Yeah, just going to get things done, just boundless energy. Um, and people with boundless energy can sometimes uh, overwhelm others who don't have that kind of energy. But in closing, I think this is significant um, let me give you one more thing right here. I had it uh, just for practical tips uh, to see if your personality might fit. Uh, people with Paul's personality can be brutally honest. We just saw that. They tend to hold others to high standards. They give advice that hasn't been asked for. Don't you see this in Paul? Do you see this in yourself? They forget to praise partial progress in others. That's kind of been a thing in our house. We've always said growing up, you have to praise partial progress, progress 
uh, in people, in each other and in people. They're frustrated with people who don't put forth as much effort as they do. They don't want others fixing them. Uh, and so those are just some traits too we might see in ourselves that would go along with the traits that Paul had. But in Philippians 1, 3 through 8, we get a glimpse of Paul's sentimental side. Who thought that Paul had a soft side, huh? But he says uh, in those verses, one, two, three, four times, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Then he says in verse four, always in every prayer of mine for you all. He says, I have you in my heart in verse seven. In verse eight, he says, how greatly I long after you all. Like, it's just a sentimental side. He's a tough guy, obviously, but just a sentimental side to him, too. And I think that's where we see that spirit-controlled um, way about somebody. Grace makes a huge difference in our personalities. We have, um, I have a grandson who's eight. His name is Cade. And uh, he is a, he's a boss. Ever since he was about two years old, we've always said, oh, he's going to be a boss someday. He's just, you can already see it in, in the way God made him. But he's got such a tender heart. He'll come up to you and rub your back or, you know, all of us girls, he'll come up and rub our back or give us a hug or something like that. Just very sweet. And he told his sister, who's 14, he told her Sunday night, he said, you know, Avon, what I'd like to do, I want to pay your way through college. He's eight, and he's already thinking he'd like to pay Avon's way through college. So these kind of personalities can have a soft, sentimental side. But Paul's advice, because he was so serious-minded, such a driven personality, but he did say this, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Can you see Paul enjoying much of his life? But he says, that's my charge. Yeah, trust in the living God who, give, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And so I would encourage you to take that as good advice right there that Paul leaves us with. And so maybe in studying Paul's personality today, do you see yourself? If not, I think you probably can find somebody that you know or that you live with that has this personality. And maybe that will help you understand why they say what they say and do what they do. And um, I hope... It just kind of sinks right in. Next week's lesson is going to cover Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John, the one Jesus loved. He refers to himself that way, and I'll tell you why next week. But I hope you'll join us. I'll try to have the online version of the series up by Thursday each week. We're doing them on Tuesdays now, so that gives me a couple of days to sit down at home and actually do it for you. But thank you for joining me. I hope you'll invite others to join us again next week.